Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Horse Geeks podcast, where we look at horses and riding from the inside out. I'm Kirsten Nelson, professional horse trainer, and with me is my good friend, Deb Romero, certified Alexander Technique instructor. So today's topic is saddles, saddle fitting. I think we have to talk about saddle fitting for the horse and saddle fitting for the rider. Oh, wow. Good idea. Yeah. And this picks up a little bit. Last podcast, we talked about um, selling horses and before that, buying horses. And I think one of the challenges in the horse industry is how many professionals work on commission. And saddles is another example of having to kind of having to weed through people who are actually reps for specific companies or they have their saddle fitting expertise through a saddle company. So you're right. they're, they're working on commissions and really there a lot of saddle fitters, their basis of education is only with one saddle company. Yes. So every saddle company has a different theory on construction, fitting horses, how it how a saddle is supposed to fit the horse, how a saddle is supposed to fit the rider. And so it, when you get a, a basically a sales rep for a saddle company, that sales rep is already sold on that theory. They believe that particular mm. theory is the best theory for all saddle fitting. So that's why they rep for that company. And what they're going to do is find a saddle for you out of their selection, out of their line. I've been through that exact thing. Yeah. there. And I don't know if it was necessarily the best saddle for that horse. Or for you. Or for me, or trying to find a saddle to fit more than one horse. Exactly. Like if you're a horse owner with multiple horses. Right. Do you need a saddle for every horse? Or do you That's need one question. saddle that fits every horse? Or yeah, fitting so, me because my body structure is completely, you know, I'm only five one with no legs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So fit that on a 17 hand warm blood. I don't know. And actually let's start there because it's a little easier to talk about finding a saddle that fits the rider than it Mm. is to talk about saddles that fit the horses. And I mean, when I started, I went to the tack shop, sat in a saddle that was the right price and took it home without (laughs) even thinking whether or not it fit my horse. I go, that's kind of where we all start. I think I did too. I think I (laughs) way back when, when I was a kid, I had one of those, and it's probably appropriate today, one of those really thin, flat jumping saddles, you know, it didn't have anything on it. It was just completely naked. Yeah. And I think when we get to talking about sort of fitting the, the horse, well, it's both for horse and rider, but I see over the years, a lot of fad and fashion in saddle design. Good point. So when we talk about fitting the rider to the saddle, um, again, there's fad and fashion And the saddle companies, like that's why understanding how to fit the saddle to the horse is actually a little bit more important because all saddle companies are selling saddles to humans. So I didn't think that way. Some of the fad in fashion is to help the human, but not necessarily factoring in the comfort level of the horse. Right. So interesting. So, you know, selling to the human to help them feel more secure, to help them become more effective, to cushion them or support the rider. That's one of the primary sort of design directives is make the rider happy because the rider is the one who pays for the saddle. Yeah, true. Right. So sometimes what's good for the horse you, you have to balance what works for the rider with what works for that horse. That's what I find as a trainer. And so the first thing is, as a rider, we should, if we don't know anything about fitting a saddle to us or fitting a saddle to our horse, it is really helpful to find a saddle fitter. 
and usually, you know, the feed, the feed store, your friends, a tack shop, somebody will know of mm -hmm. some saddle fitters. Or if you do your own research and you like a particular saddle that you see online, they will probably have a rep for that company and you can go that direction. There are saddle fitters out there who are just super well educated in the mechanics of movement. And a lot of them will also deal in used saddles. So they won't, they might uh, rep. That's cool. Like some saddle fitters will be a rep for, for several saddle companies, or they might be a rep for their favorite saddle company. But in addition to that, they deal in used saddles. And those are the reps or the, the saddle fitters, sorry, that you want to seek out because right. they generally have a broader base of knowledge and they'll work with you as an individual, with your horse as an individual, and maybe start you with a used saddle, especially if you don't know what you want to do with your horse. You're maybe a new horse owner and you just need something safe to ride in. Right. Right. And if you go with a company, they're going to sell you a saddle that's within their their line of products. So either you can decide, do your own research online, talk to a lot of people and decide, yep, that's the company for me. That's what I want to try and go with that brand of saddle. So the saddles primarily are going to break into Western or English. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> but there's a huge variety of types of saddles within both of those basic saddle designs. So the Western saddles, you can get short skirts, long skirts, without a horn, without a tree, um, different types of trees based on functionality. Like they have roping saddles or barrel racing saddles or trail riding saddles. Um, there's a huge variety of types of Western saddles, uh, endurance saddles kind of falls in the Western type. Sort of. of I was going to ask you that. Where does that fall? Endurance or. It, it's more like what describes a Western saddle is actually versus an English saddle are actually the trees. That's what I thought. The trees so, are quite different. The trees are very different. So underneath the seat of the saddle is where the tree is. And the trees in most Western saddles are made of wood. And in most mm -hmm. English saddles, traditionally they were metal, but now they can be a composite or a plastic, something like that. Trees can be adjustable on some saddles, <laughs> but the tree, and then there's tree-less saddles also, which means it's just cushion and no hard metal, wood, composite, anything like that. So traditionally, the Western saddles have wood trees, but a lot of them are plastic now. Some of them are flexible trees. Some of them are solid trees. And the design of a Western tree is kind of like an hourglass. So it's a broad okay. tree. So under the seat of the saddle, you have kind of a little bowing out under the horn and then it narrows down where the rider sits and the legs go and then okay. it broadens out again towards the cantle or the skirt of the saddle and so it's kind of almost an an hourglass that's cut in half with a gullet between the two halves of the tree so those little bowing out sections are technically called the points of the tree okay so the points are for the lateral stability of the saddle. So it doesn't roll back and forth. And then the length of the tree is for just the general stability of the saddle. So the tree is meant to distribute the rider's body weight over a greater surface area, which is how it protects the horse's back and helps everything feel more stable. Right. So if you're in a treeless saddle or bareback, your body weight is distributed over a smaller surface area. So there's more pounds per sense. square inch. Right. So people ask a lot like and, and the reason I think some people go with treeless saddles is because some trees, depending on the shape of the horse's back, some trees can create discomfort for horses. You can't find one that fits just right. 
um, it either pinches, it either gaps or pinches. Yeah. So, so treeless is just going to mold to the shape of the horse's back, but it's like kind of a more solid bareback pad. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I haven't ridden in it that I know of ridden in a treeless saddle, but wouldn't you have to be more of a stable rider? It'd be like riding bareback. You know, you, you've really got to be kind of spot on. With yeah, your balance and a treeless saddle has a lot more substance to it than, uh, say, a bareback pad. So you okay. do get you do get some weight distribution through treeless saddles just because it it's thicker cushioning. It's more saddle like. So you get some weight distribution through that over a greater surface area. But without the tree and the points, it's not going to have lateral stability. Right. That's what I was thinking. And depending on how the rider rides, if a rider is very heavy in their seat, then you will get a concentrated amount of weight over a smaller surface area. Yep. Because that makes the, sense. Yeah. And so that's in an English saddle, the um, you have the points and the bars. And the bars in an English saddle are very narrow usually made of metal or a composite or hard plastic. And they just sort of run from the front of the saddle to the back of the saddle, two parallel rectangular shapes mm -hmm. that kind of, you know, go under the seat of the saddle. And then on the front of those, they, they have the points, which if you looked at it from a bird's eye view would be these two parallel um, rectangle shapes with um, a little rectangle off the front. So if you look down on an English saddle tree, it would look like a T that was split in half. Okay. If you look down at a tree on a Western saddle, it looks like an hourglass that was split in half. And the reason it's always split in half is because to protect the horse's spine, there should be a what's called a gullet, which is an empty space that doesn't touch the horse. It bridges the area of the spine. So if that gullet is really narrow, it can create pressure points on the bone tendon or ligament of the spine. So okay. the space down the center of the saddle should bridge from the muscle of the back on one side to the muscle of the back on the other side. That's part of and that's why it's designed that way. So whether it's English or Western, there should be enough space that the bars lay over the muscle of the back and they're not creating pressure points in towards the bony part of the spine. And then whether it's the hourglass or the T split in half, the little front wings on an English saddle, the T or the points, are to prevent the saddle from rolling side to side. And the hourglass shape of the Western tree is also to prevent the rolling side to side, but they have one in front and one towards the back of the saddle. And so some horses, well, for, let's stick with riders. So first, the rider has to decide, do I want a Western type saddle or do I want an English type saddle? Right, your discipline, whatever you're going to be riding. Right. And um, that's kind of a personal preference, depending on what you're going to do with your horse and what you feel comfortable in. Some people really love Western saddles. Some people really love English saddles. That's just, to me, a personal preference. And the balance of the horse, the fitting, the fitting is a little different because of the two very big differences in the construction mm -hmm. of each saddle. But basically, if you want a Western saddle, you can get it treeless. You can get it with or without a horn. It typically will always have a high cantle in front mm -hmm. and a very high, or sorry, pommel in front and cantle behind. So it'll have a little bit of a deeper seat than some of the English saddles. So the English saddles are just less saddle. The Western saddles are all more saddle. Right. And they're heavier usually. <laughs> and they're heavier. Just just putting them on is a big deal. 
Yeah, and the price range can range from under a thousand dollars to over five thousand dollars. Yep. Right, and they come in leather and synthetic, or any combination thereof. And so you kind of have to decide as a rider which way do I want to go. The thing that doesn't change, whether you have an English saddle or a Western saddle with all the features that make you feel snug and secure in the saddle. <laughs> so like the closest thing to a Western saddle in the English models would be these, you know, deep seated dressage saddles with big thigh blocks, high pommels, high cantles. They're sort of closest to a Western saddle as far okay. as that support to the rider. Right to keep you in. But like when you work with riders, Deb, like when I work as a trainer, I don't even really consider the saddle because it has nothing to do with the how the rider balances or how the horse balances. That's, that's all that's internal. What, that's why I've been so quiet because <laughs> I've, just, I've just been mulling all of that in my head going like, but, you know, it's kind of like you can have the best this saddle, but if you have poor rider biomechanics. It, yes. You, yeah. And I think a lot of times what saddle companies are selling and bit companies do the same thing. They're selling the magic bullet. Right. They're telling you, if you buy this saddle, your horse will go better. And I don't, that's not <laughs> true. <laughs> that's, I mean, at some point you'll have to ask me what kind of saddle I have. <laughs> what kind of saddle do you have? I've got a cheap WinTech. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's where I find price really doesn't mean you get a better saddle. I totally agree. Mm -hmm. Because if there's anything people learn from this is that. Yeah. Absolutely. The the cost of the saddle does not guarantee. And, and some custom saddles are my biggest nightmare as a trainer. Yes. Custom because fitted, custom you, made saddles. Once you flock them a certain way or they come made a certain way, if the horse has any changes, what do you do with what you have? Right. Because usually you don't have a rep close by. I mean... It's not right. like somebody comes in a week and reflocks it for you. No, horses can outgrow a saddle. Yes. 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 I had yes. a client I was working with a couple of weeks ago, and she's been riding bareback since I've been working with her. We went to put his saddle on. It's a no-go. Yeah. So the only time I look at the saddle is some saddle designs and i'll talk about that for fitting the rider it's typical with a lot of mid-range price western saddles and now it's a little bit of a fashion with a lot of dressage saddles in the mid to high price price range that they're hanging the stirrup bars so far forward from where the rider's seat bones go oh bother that it's very hard to get the rider vertical because the, the fashion that the saddle designers are sort of trying to make easy for the rider is a backwards rider. So somebody who wow. rides, you know, sitting on their pockets with their mm -hmm. body behind the, the vertical. The driving seat. Theory, the driving yeah. seat. It's really common with gated horses because the wow. part of the, tr the mythology with gated horses is you have to lean back and stick your legs out in front of you. And so anytime the rider balance goes behind vertical, it puts our legs in front of us. So the only time I run into an issue with saddle fitting for the rider is um, if the stirrups, like when you look at a saddle, say at the store, you can see the flattest part of the seat is where the rider's seat bones are intended to go. And so very close to that flat part of the seat, whether it's English or Western, the stirrups should be hanging very close to that flat section, if not directly under that flat section of the seat, right? So I've gotten um, with some Western saddles, 
which have a rise to the seat. So I've it's not a, it, like a lot of English saddles are a tiny bit flatter than a lot of Western saddles. So some Western saddles, the seat actually slopes yes. from front to back. So yes. it's literally putting the rider's seat bones, the flat part of the saddle is way back towards the cantle or the, right. rather than in the center of the seat. And then the fenders or the stirrups are hung up closer to where that rise is. So there's no way that I can get the rider vertical on their seat bones without them banging their crotch. <laughs> it's yep. like, you can't do it. And so I go, that's a saddle design that really works against rider balance. Yeah. And it, it's not uncommon where they're putting the flat part of the seat farther back than the center of the saddle and they're hanging the stirrup bars farther forward. That will force the rider back on their pockets. You know, that's kind of interesting comparing it to um, people's lifestyles now is that most people, they don't even have to be riders. They sit that way. Right. So this is just not in the rider community. Everybody's doing this now. They no, and I was wondering, vertical. like I notice when I get in and out of different cars, ah. there's some cars that sort of sit, allow you to sit vertically easily. And some cars like bucket seats have yes. a very sloped back seat where you're meant to lean back to yes. be in the seat. <laughs> which if you're driving at a hundred miles an hour, that's probably useful. That's probably great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because it's, it's helping you stay back when the force of motion is really strong, but yeah, but, but it's, it's that sort it's of like our chairs saddles are like our chairs. They're designing chairs for bad posture. Right. To support to support that backwards sit. Right. Not to so sit vertical. If the saddle, and that's kind of what I'm describing, if the flattest part of the seat is not in the center of the saddle, but it's backwards, and if the stirrup bars are hung forward, then it's meant to put you in a chair or sitting position. Right. And rider balance, whether it's an English saddle, Western saddle, whether I look at a dressage rider or a really good cowboy, they look like they're standing. Exactly. They're not sitting. So our vertical alignment in the saddle should always make us feel like we're standing over the horse rather than sitting in the saddle. And the saddle just has to be designed to allow that. Right. Right. So that's one of the features, whether it's English, Western, treeless, trees, whatever, that feature is super important for the rider balance. That when you sit in the saddle or straddle it at the store, that you can find a standing sensation with your legs underneath you. So are you saying even when you try a saddle, make sure you have stirrups? Because a lot of them in the stores don't have stirrups on them. They're just. Right. But even if you place yourself in the seat, like they have that plastic horse that you can maybe get your legs right. off the ground. So if you straddle the saddle at the store, you should have your legs under you, not in front of you. Okay. And you can look under there and check where's the metal ring or where's that stirrup bar where the stirrups are going to hang from. Does it allow my thigh to hang under my pelvis? Right. And that's whether or not you ride with short stirrups or long stirrups. Right. Right. Which is the other saddle feature I wanted to talk about for the rider is the length of the seat has more to do with whether we prefer to ride with short stirrups or long stirrups than it does the size of our ass. I go, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it really has nothing to do with the size of your butt, right? <laughs> it has more to do with the length of your legs. So, and if you ride with short stirrups, like jumping, racing, like a racing saddle is a super long seat because even these tiny jockeys are riding with their ankles on the flaps, right? right? So they have super short stirrups, which means that's going to put your seat and Way your torso back. farther yeah. back, right? That makes sense. So like if I have a jump saddle, I'm going to get one with a much longer seat length 
than I will a dressage saddle. Right now, in some Western saddles, if I'm a trail rider, I might want shorter stirrups than if I am doing ranch work. So traditionally, when you ride Western, all riders ride with long stirrup lengths. Right. Right. In English, you can go from jockey position to dressage length. So in English, if you ride dressage, it's going to be more of you can deal with a shorter length of seat because your leg is going to be longer. That makes sense. I like that comparison. Yeah. And if you're a jump rider, you can have a tiny little cute butt, but you need a long seat (laughs) (laughs) because your leg is going to be more bent and you need room because otherwise you can't get your stirrup short enough to really get into a proper two point for jumping (laughs) <laughs> or if you shorten the stirrups, it puts you behind the back of the saddle. Right. That's what, that's what I was just thinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the length of the seat, you have to, at the store, mimic your comfortable stirrup length to know if that seat fits you. And then that length of seat where your seat bones go should be the flattest part of the seat So it's easy to be there with whatever length of stirrup you like. So that's, that's almost kind of it. Oh, the other thing to factor in as a rider, there is a whole theory of saddle fitting that believes you need to fit the saddle a bit wide, very generously for the horse. And the side effect of that is that the saddle has less inherent stability for the rider. The other I line of saddle. Had, oh, go ahead. We've had we've had conversations about because both of us tend to be riding other horses with other people's saddles. Yes. And I find it harder to stabilize myself and the horse with a wide yes. tree as a And there can be a tree that's too narrow too. I get that. I mean, yes, but the wide tree is harder for me. Yes. So, and that is like some horses need a wide tree just to be comfortable. So the theory, the, the way of thinking behind that theory is that if the saddle is creating pinching points or it's restricting the horse's back muscle use or shoulders in any way, then you're never going to get good performance out of the horse. So even though it's harder for the rider to ride in a saddle that's wide, if it fits the horse better, the whole picture is better off and the rider just has to step up to the plate. So it's possible for the rider, but you have to work harder as a rider to maintain your own stability. Yes, that's, that's what I found. Yes. The other mode of thinking is that the tree should fit well, and it used to be nobody thought about whether or not the tree fit the horse. So you it didn't you, matter who cared. <laughs> yeah, like I did. I bought a saddle at the store and threw it on and went, looks good. Yeah, to here me. we go. Right. And what that can do, the reason the whole theory of wide saddles sort of evolved was because it was very common to have a tree or a saddle that was creating a pain issue for the horse. A pinch. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and that's why getting a saddle fitter to help you is always a good idea. Even if, you know, in, as a owner, you have to take it with a grain of salt. If they also rep a specific company, that's all, but they'll still have some good information for you. And each saddle company ascribes to either wider equals better or narrow equals better. That's that's what I've seen. (laughs) <laughs> and what what I find as a trainer, and you probably find working with rider balance, is it depends. <laughs> it depends. You it know, depends. and we've had this conversation before. Both of us feel that our best mentors, when we come to them and say, I've got this, 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 what should I do? And they say, It depends. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> And what I mean by there's no direct answer, there's well, and what I mean by that specifically, when I say it depends, I'm going to look at the rider, how confident, how athletic, 
how well balanced is this particular rider? Exactly. If I have a rider that's pretty experienced, very confident on the back of a horse and really has pretty good balance, that's a rider that could cope with trying out a saddle that's less stable, which would be your treeless saddles or your wider saddles. If I have a rider that's just learning to ride and getting their balance, and they asked me, what do you recommend for a saddle? I would say, don't get anything fancy, but fit it snugly, which doesn't mean making it too tight, but it means don't go too wide. Right. Because that rider needs the saddle to have some inherent stability because they don't have it yet. Right. And then the same with the horse. You can have a horse that's very unstable. Right. And you can have a horse that's really super tight. And so again, the saddle fit, whether you leave a little bit of extra room for the horse to either, if they are very atrophied and underdeveloped, as they develop muscle, they will measure wider for their saddle fitting. So you could leave a little wiggle room and use some padding so you're not having to buy a new saddle every year. Um, But the rider has to be able to cope with that. Yes. Yeah. And then there's, when you go to fit a saddle on a horse, I learned with the sort of, you know, hand under the withers, you had to have at least three fingers width between the withers and the middle of the front of the saddle. Mm -hmm. And that's so simplistic. It's like, oh, no, 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 that's not really a good measuring tool. There's more to it than that. But unfortunately, But the saddle fitter will go over details of saddle fit. What I look at and what every rider can look at as a quick fit is when you place the saddle on the horse's back with no pads and don't girth it up. You're just placing it on the horse's back. And the way you know the design of the saddle where it's meant to go on the back is wherever the girth or the cinch Um, where those rings, they have to line up to the narrowest part of the horse's chest cavity. It's called the heart girth, just behind the elbow, right? So when you place the saddle on the horse's back, you know whether to move it forward or backwards towards the head or the tail based on where the cinch or the girth goes just behind the horse's front legs in the narrowest part of the barrel, So if you place the saddle and the cinch or the girth is not in the narrowest part of the barrel, it will be when you ride. (laughs) (laughs) So it will loosen. (laughs) Yippee. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And that's no good. You don't want the girth or the cinch suddenly too loose. So like one of the fashions in saddle placement of all things has been three fingers behind the shoulder blade is where you put the front of the saddle. And it's just become a fashion in maybe the past 10 years. And the idea behind it is to free the shoulder, whether it's a Western or an English saddle. I see people doing that in both types of riding. What they're not considering. And then the demo that the saddle fitter gives you is they stretch that front leg out as far as it'll go. And they show you how far back the scapula goes towards the saddle. So they yeah, go, you, I had that. you need room to let that scapula move. And I go, number one, unless you're doing extended walk and trot, you're not going to have that issue. And even then, a balanced horse's scapula doesn't really move that far. That's an exaggeration. It's a stretch, but it's not a natural movement when you're under saddle. The other issue I find that I tell people is I go, look, if I have to place the saddle over the shoulder blades versus setting the saddle behind the shoulder blades, but it starts to put pressure on the low back. Yeah. I go, if you, because at the end of the rib cage is where the horse's lumbar starts. And it's just as... It's just as fragile as our low back. It's only supported with muscle. So ideally, whatever length of seat we need should sit on our horse between the shoulder blades and the last rib. So the back of the saddle should not extend past the last rib. 
even if you have right. a Western saddle with a big leather skirt on the back, ideally it doesn't go past the last rib. So that's how I fit it to a horse. So I place the saddle on the horse's back with nothing. You can check to make sure wherever you place it front to back, number one, the girth will go in the narrowest part of the barrel just behind the front legs. Then once it's placed there, I look at the seat. And the flattest part of the seat where the rider's seat bones go should sit level to the horizon. So then it's a good fit for the horse, right? Then if I have the, the tree goes a little bit over the shoulder blades or it goes maybe a hair past the last rib over the low back, that's manageable. But the bulk of the saddle has to sit between the withers and the last rib. And you can feel the last rib with your fingers. And when you run your fingers up the last rib from the barrel towards the back, it goes forward. So you don't have as much space. If you look at the bottom part of that rib, you think you have more back space than you do because that rib goes, as you follow it with your fingers upward, it's also going to go towards the head. Right. Same so with people. Yeah. So for fitting the horse, it's pretty simple. Every horse owner can do it. You place the saddle on the back, you get the girth lined up where it should be. And then you check, is it fitting between the shoulder and the last rib? And then when you look at the seat, it will either be slightly, like I tell people, I go, imagine you're going to pour water on that seat. Would it pool right there? That's level to the horizon. Or would it start running forward to the front of the saddle? Or would it start running a bit backwards towards the back of the saddle? So if that flat part of the saddle is a little bit tilted up in front and down towards the back of the saddle, then the tree with the points or the front part of the tree is too narrow for that horse's back. Okay. Right? So that's a saddle that will pinch. That will create a lot of discomfort. It'll pinch around the shoulder blades and it'll also throw the rider backwards and put too much weight towards the low back on the horse, right? If it sits level, it fits. It's a good fit for the horse. If it tilts forward, if towards the front of the saddle, if the middle flat part of the seat tilts a little bit towards the front of the saddle, then the saddle is too wide. And what you could do, which is the thought behind the wide fitted saddles, is you add padding to the front of the saddle. And when I was a kid, it was a fashion if the seat slanted backwards that you add a pad to the back of the saddle to make mm -hmm. it level. I remember that. But what that ends up doing, the reason it lost its fashion is because it pinches incredibly the horse's mm -hmm. shoulders and the upper back. So I never add padding to the back of a saddle, but if needed, I will add padding to the front of the saddle to make it level. And that supports the rider sitting level as well. Ideally, if I want a snug fit with a um, with some inherent stability in the fit, then when I place it on the horse's back and line up the girth or the cinch, that flat part of the saddle should be <clears throat> level to the horizon. Okay. That's where my seat bones should balance. And then the stirrup bar should allow my leg to be underneath me from there. So just to recap, fitting the rider, length of seat depends on length of leg and how long you keep you, you ride your stirrup your length, stirrups. right? Um, you want to make sure the saddle you're picking out isn't going to put you in a sitting position. It's going to allow a standing position. So the stirrup bars need to be close to the flattest part of the seat. And then you have to decide, do I want a saddle <clears throat> or need a saddle that's a little towards the wide side, or do I really need the stability factor, which means I'm going to fit it snug, but not too tight. I think one of the main things that sticks out for me is to realize you may go through several saddles. It's not a one-time fit. Right. And so Wintech as a company came up with a 
they call it the easy change gullet system with mm-hmm. different widths. Have, yeah. yeah. It's not easy to change. You no, need a screwdriver, <laughs> but it is changeable. <clears throat> and other saddles, you can change out trees. So if you're right. starting with a young horse or a horse that's really lost its muscle that you're rehabbing, if you have a healthy developed back, you probably won't have to change saddle sizes. But if you have anything other than a well-developed back muscle and a healthy horse, then you may have to go with wider trees over time. It depends. So as a rider, um, seat length, where the stirrups are hung, type of saddle and fitting theory. That's kind of what you have to consider for the saddle you're picking out for yourself. Does it fit the horse? We don't, we, we, we need a saddle fitter to go into all the details, but if we don't have a saddle fitter available, place the saddle on the horse's back, look at where the flattest part of the seat sits level to the horizon while the girth is in the right space of, of the narrowest part of the barrel. If it goes a little over the scapula, like a lot of Western saddles, because of the skirt and the horn, mm-hmm. they will go over the shoulder blades. Right. But are they interfering with it? No, because if they go over the shoulder blades and it's really too narrow for them, then the middle of the seat, the flat part of the seat is going to slope backwards. Yeah. That and that's sense. how you know I you like need that. a wider saddle. If it goes a little bit past the last rib, but the rider's seat bones are not adding weight to that problem, then you can go, the saddle skirt can extend a little bit past the last rib as long as the rider can be vertical because it's really the weight has to stay over the thorax, which is the thoracic spine, rib cage, and sternum of the horse. That's the barrel. Right. That's the most stable part of the horse's body for us to straddle. And that's where the rider needs to feel like they're standing over that rib cage. They're not leaning back on it. They're not leaning too far forward. And the saddle isn't extending much past that thorax. So saddle fitting for the horse, if you want to go out to the barn and check your own saddle fit today, (laughs) that's how you can do it. And if you've been placing the saddle too far back in order to free the shoulders, you may be having issues with sore back. You may be having overdeveloped loin muscles, but underdeveloped upper back muscles near the withers. So just placing the saddle to where the billet straps on an English saddle or the ring for the cinch on a Western saddle should hang directly over the narrowest part of the horse's barrel, which is about as far forward on the barrel as you can get without running into the front legs. So I'm getting a vision of my saddle on my big mare. And it seems that I it might be too small for her because it seems like there's a slant to where the girth goes. No, don't worry about the slant to where the girth goes. It's the center of the saddle, the flat, the, the, every saddle, the flat part of the saddle. Yes. Okay. And that's how, you know, because even if the saddle is over the scapula, if it fits properly, that every single saddle has a small flat part because that's where the rider's seat bones go. Our seat okay. bones are not very big. Even no. if we're a really big person. They're still anatomically not big and not far apart. Right. So every saddle will have anywhere from a, you know, two inch to four inch flat area. Some saddles, that flat area will be towards the cantle or towards the back of the saddle. Um, with the stirrup bars way in front. That's a saddle that's designed for the rider to sit backwards. That's what you want to avoid, whether it's English or Western, right? So where that flat area is, it's only like on super high cantles, like dressage saddles, they leave you only maybe two inches of flat surface for your seat bones. Right. Because you're meant to ride with a very long stirrup and a very standing position. So they only leave you an inch or two for your seat bones in the flattest part of the saddle. 
and the front of the saddle kind of slopes from front down to that flat part and the back goes from that flat part back up to a high cantle. Western saddles can be the same, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of Western saddles, the thing you really have to look out for is if it has a steep, what they call rise, which is the seat itself really goes up from that flat yeah, area seen that. to it's the almost, horn. It, yeah, I've seen that. And those are really hard for me to ride on. Yeah, because if they're designed like the really good Western saddles almost have a flat seat. If they yeah. have a rise, it's not much of one at all. So if you have a Western saddle with a really steep rise, it's working against your balance and it's putting your weight towards the horse's low back, right? So I look for Western saddles and Wintech, Abetta, there's a lot of synthetic Western saddles point. that if you're a trail rider, the cost is low and they're actually really well-designed saddles. Mm -hmm. And I find price has nothing to do with the quality of the saddle. Like you might be paying for a lot of expensive leather and a very poor design. Good or point. Like this. Kind of like a car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. There's some very expensive cars that notoriously have bad performance. Yes. 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 Same can happen with saddles. Right. And you can get some very expensive English saddles that do the same thing. They're trying to put the rider in an armchair position rather yes. than allowing the rider to be vertical to find their own balance. And some people feel more secure there. The truth is you're not secure. If that saddle oh. slips, you're at the mercy. You're, of the done. you're gone. Yeah, you're gone. So people go with tighter, sticky saddle pads, tighter girths, sticky girths. And I go, the problem is there's too much weight behind the movement of the horse. You have to get up vertical to be in sync with the movement of the horse. That's yes. where the security is. So when you look for that flat part of the seat, when you, like you may see the front of the saddle might look a little higher than the back of the saddle might be what mm -hmm. you're describing. Yeah. So you, you really have to place the saddle where the girth goes and then see is the flat part of the saddle allowing me to keep my seat bones vertical? Okay, that's what I'll play with. That sounds like a good idea. Yeah, and then the rest of it can be kind of an optical illusion. Yeah, it depend can. depending on the design of the saddle. Yeah, so that's fitting the horse. If you place the saddle on their back, it's a two minute assessment. I go, I line up the billet straps or the cinch, and then I look for the flat spot in the saddle. And if it's level, we're good to go. If it's sloping forward, I can add a little padding under the front of the saddle. And if it's sloping backwards, I go, what you're really fighting is not a behavioral issue with your horse. You're fighting discomfort, possibly pain. Right? So then I go, that saddle that slopes where the flat part slopes backwards, that's a saddle that's getting in the way of the horse being comfortable during work. So you're going to have more behavioral issues, more resistance, poor performance, if that's the case. Right. So that's um, how I would just look at it and go. Works for now. Right. Works for now. Works for now. And like we talked about. That fit has nothing to do with the price of the saddle. Exactly. And I got to say, in my experience, the really low end plastic fantastics, I call them, all these Wintex, <laughs> I go, the saddle design is pretty good. It's not trying yes. to do anything fancy. It's trying exactly. to keep the cost down. So a lot of these synthetic saddles actually have better designs than the medium market. So that mid market where the saddle designer is sort of trying to do something for the rider, but maybe without enough knowledge or experience to help the horse, you get into these murky areas where the saddle is actually working against the balance of the horse or the balance of the rider. Yes. Right. And so the kind of $2,000 saddles, $3,000 saddles, I go or custom made saddles, which are yes. customized to support the imbalance of the horse and the rider. Yes. 
I go, give me factory direct any day over a yeah. custom saddle. Because a factory direct saddle is fitting a theoretically balanced horse. That's a good point. And I think that's where some of these smaller companies, you know, the WinTech type saddles are coming from. Yeah, it's simple. It's a it, no yeah. frills design. And I go, that makes the saddle comfortable and neutral between the horse and rider. I like that. It's neutral. It's, it's neutral. not influencing either one. Right. And then you like can that. really find your balance. And that's actually what the high end of the market does too. So I find if you're in the saddle shopping area over $4,000, you're going to get a really good design and really good leather, really good construction. And at the low end, the unpretentious synthetic saddles, you get simplified design that just is neutral. So at right. the very high end of the market and the very low end of the market, you get the, I find the best design work as far as letting the rider balance, letting the horse balance. It's that mid-range market, you know, where people are finding, I, I want an expensive saddle, but not that expensive. And then you're getting into these murky areas where the saddle's sort of trying to please the rider, but not mm. fully understanding the mechanics of it all. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. And it's true whether it's English or Western saddles. Yes. So like, you know, my favorite training saddle and um, there's there's a whole category of saddles called training saddles. So in Western training saddles, it's called a buckaroo style, it has an A-fork tree and a, a, a fork up front, which is your the width of your horn and the front of the saddle, like the points and a wade tree, which has a wide gullet and sort of flat rather than angled has sort of flat um, bars. So that design, that feature of that saddle allows that saddle to fit a huge variety of horse mm. shapes and sizes. So when I looked for a training saddle in the English version, it's the same features. It's almost an A fork, which means kind of a narrow, points at the front of the saddle and almost flat bars. And I found one that was also close contact. So I use the Marcel is the saddle company. It's a French saddle company. And the model I use is a Samba. And that allows me to put that saddle on multiple horses in training because of the way that it design, it's designed. So it allows, and you have to find, if you have multiple horses, you right. have to find, and the WinTech addresses it because you have the interchangeable gullet system and you have no frills in the design. Exactly. So if, I, if people have multiple horses, I'll sometimes advise a synthetic saddle over a $3,000 midline, $2,000 kind of middle of the road leather saddle whether it's English or Western. And, um, and then when like buckaroos, buckaroos are what are, it's the Western old fashioned Western term for colt starters or the horse mechanic of the ranch, the one who gets all the young horses going and deals with the problem horses. So the buckaroo style saddle is meant to be so simple that it fits lots of different shapes and sizes. So you can mm -hmm. use the same saddle on multiple horses pretty successfully. And then the Samba, this, this English saddle I found, follows that same design idea. But mm -hmm. one of the biggest differences is when, when I spend a lot of time in England, if you go to Europe or England, every horse has its saddle with different riders. Right, <clears throat> And when you come to America, every rider has their saddle that they want to put on different horses. That's interesting. And I go, if you have a saddle that was built in the category of training saddle, which is what I described, then I can use my saddle on multiple horses, but that's a specific design. If I just have right. a jumping saddle, a trail saddle, a barrel saddle, 
or even a general purpose saddle, it's called in English. You have dressage, jumping, racing, and general purpose. Right. Those are the main categories. So if I have a dressage saddle that I like, it's not necessarily going to fit every horse I put it on. I have to check every horse. Some of them, it's going to be too big, some too small, too wide or too narrow. And so when you have a training saddle or a simple saddle, whether it's expensive or cheap, it's the simplicity of the design that allows it to fit multiple horses. Yes. The more the saddle is designed to put the rider in a position give the rider these massive thigh blocks and deep seat and all of that, that the more it fits the rider and serves the rider, the less adaptable it is horse to horse to horse to horse. So mm -hmm. sort of depends. But that's why you like the saddle you like, because you have three horses. And right. I like the saddle I like because I ride different horses all the time when they come in training. Right. Right. And some horses have to come with their own saddle in training, but I find it's been 90% successful that the saddle I have sits level on almost every horse I put it in, which I go, it's a work of art. It's also, depending on which model you get, four to $6,000 saddle. I go, yeah. not everybody can afford that, but as a professional, it works for me. Right. Right. And it, what's crazy about it is it looks like a nothing little saddle. It reminds the, me of my old close contact saddle when I was a kid. Yeah. And so it's a close contact seat, like a jump seat with yeah. dressage flaps. That's and cool. So it has long flaps, but it has a jump seat. So it's a weird saddle, but I absolutely love it. And, and so as a trainer, it's a particularly good saddle if you need to use the same saddle on different horses. Some trainers just say, send your bridle, send your saddle when your horse is in training. Because like in England, if you've taken the time to fit your saddle to your horse, then you know it fits. Right. And I think traditionally, the reason that happened is like a lot of cowboys, when when you know, as we were settling the U.S., we had wild horses and Mustangs, but not a lot of cowboys. We had more horses, fewer cowboys. Right. So the cowboys would take their saddle and it was part of using it on all these different wild horses. So it was the saddle for the rider that just went on any horse. And in Europe, you fit the saddle to the horse. And even if you change riders, the saddle goes with the horse because of the fitting. And that was a situation where horses were much more expensive, harder to keep. And so you had more riders than you had horses. So the tradition sort of evolved out of the fact that horses were more scarce than people. And in the US, people were more scarce than horses. That's a good history lesson. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And ideally, it doesn't really matter what kind of saddle you have. The thing that makes me crazy is when I see somebody in a dressage saddle with great big thigh blocks and a very deep seat with that little one inch space for your seat bones, mm. but they ride with their stirrups too short. I go, if you shorten the stirrups, if you have a design that's really meant to keep the rider in a Light. locked position, mm -hmm. <clears throat> then you don't get to choose your stirrup length for that seat. Good point. Right. So people who get these big, deep dressage saddles with huge thigh blocks, they'll shorten their stirrups because that's where they've been riding. That's where they feel comfortable. But it puts their knee against the thigh block or the lower thigh up against the thigh block instead of the upper thigh. Right. And a short stirrup in that type of seat is literally going to push the rider out of the center of the saddle. So you're no longer getting your seat bones on the flat surface. A lot of rider seat bones wind up on the slope. Yep. And that screws up all the balance Everything. through their whole torso. So a lot of times if the rider has their stirrups, because it's not uncommon with novice riders or tricky horses, the shorter the stirrups, the more we can kind of brace our weight into the stirrups for stability. So a lot of people feel more secure with short stirrups. But I go, if 
if the stirrup is too short for the design of the saddle, it's going to take your seat bones off of the flat spot yep. of the saddle. I've seen that. Yeah. And I am notorious for lengthening and pe- lengthening and shortening people's stirrups in a lesson because I can't help them balance with the stirrup length they have. And I've taken stirrups down three to five holes in a lesson. That's what I've done. Yeah. It's like a huge at least three. amount. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so in a Western saddle and these deep seated English saddles, you really are supposed to be riding with a long leg. Yes. And what's interesting is the short stirrup that pushes the rider into a sitting position makes them more insecure. It makes them grip more. It makes, makes them, them grip more. muscle gripping instead of balance. And bracing, pushing, yes. sl- like jamming heels down in the yes. stirrups, pushing in the stirrups for security. And what's interesting is at first, if you lengthen the stirrups, but you don't change the vertical alignment of the seat bones, they would be very insecure. I yeah. get it. Right. But as soon as you get the seat bones in the right spot on the saddle and the torso straight and upright, all of a sudden they go, Hey, my stirrups are too short. Yep. I go, yep, they are. Let's take them down. <laughs> right. So the more we lean to the back of our pockets or the back side of the seat bones, and the more we sit back, like we're sitting rather than standing, the shorter we want our stirrups because our leg is way out in front of in us, front of in, us. It's instead of underneath. Physics. It's pure physics. Yeah. Yeah. And so you can explore stirrup length by first coming off your pockets and finding a standing sensation in the saddle more than a sitting sensation in the saddle. And that will help a lot. Yes. So that is just the tip of the iceberg, you guys. No kidding. I know. <laughs> but once again, like just like buying and selling horses, be wary of taking only the advice of a what's really a sales rep, somebody who right. is trained to fit a saddle by a specific company because they're going to sell you the saddle line that they carry. If ever you can find a saddle fitter who deals in used saddles, even if they do also rep a brand or two, and especially if they rep multiple brands, you have a more educated saddle fitter who could be more helpful because they're not just buying the company line. They're, They're actually learning about the mechanics and they will help you fit a saddle much better. And ironically, If, unless your horse is perfectly mechanically developed and well-muscled, avoid at all costs, and it does cost a lot, custom fitting. Yes. Do not go with custom fitting because they will fit the saddle to your imbalances and your horse's atrophy, to the horse's dysfunction, and they will lock you and the horse into that dysfunction. And it's big money. People think they're doing the right thing to get a custom fitted saddle. And I go, they are going to custom fit it to what you have today. And you won't be able to work your way into something better. It locks you into the deal. Exactly. Yeah. It's better to get a neutral saddle, if especially if your horse or your balance is still in development, get something minimalist and neutral and plain. Whether it's English, Western, racing, whatever, doesn't matter. And that will allow you, you want your equipment to be neutral because then you can feel what's between what your balance is and what's going on with the horse. The more complicated the equipment gets, the less we realize what's really going on. So thank you guys for joining us for another Horse Geeks podcast. We better wrap it up. I think this is a long one. And um, we look forward to seeing you next time. So please like, share, subscribe, all of that. And we'll see you once again next time. Bye, everybody. Bye.